one big family. Give Tucson a big round of applause. All right, Tucson. Good evening, and welcome to the Authors' Table Dinner at America's Best Book Festival. Ooh. I'm John Humanek, Chair of the Board of Directors, and on behalf of the Tucson Festival of Books, the Executive Board, the Steering Committee, and it's more than 2,000 volunteers. Big hands for volunteers. Thank you for joining us to delight in all forms of literature. The Tucson Festival of Books is the largest nonprofit book festival in the country. Moreover, I think the authors will tell you this is the best operated book festival and author-centric literary event anywhere. And it keeps getting better. To our authors who make TFOB the literary bestseller, we are delighted to be with you this weekend. You all are rock stars in Tucson and truly among friends and fans. And to the book lovers who support this educational community experience, your ongoing involvement, passion, and investment for the written word ensures that Tucson is the city that reads and TFOB is the greatest never-ending story. Over the previous 14 years, the festival has hosted more than 5,000 authors, participating in more than 4,000 presentations. This year, we have another incredible list of author sessions, exhibitors, and entertainers. And best of all, it's all free. With us tonight to recognize an outstanding community organization is David Cohen, treasurer of the festival's board of directors. David. Well, tonight, it's at my absolute pleasure to recognize one of the festival's outstanding speakers and partners, Western National Park Association, WNPA is a nonprofit education member of the National Park Service. They support parks across the West, developing products, services, and programs that enhance the visitor experience, understanding, and appreciation of national parks. WNPA, affectionately known as Hubbles, the oldest operate what's known as Hubbles, the oldest continuously operating trading post in the American Southwest. Their store in Northwest Tucson. You can find all kinds of American Indian art, jewelry, Mexican crafts, Southwestern food and gifts, and national park collectibles. WNPA supports the festival with including a performance stage and an exhibitor area, and representatives from the parks discuss the park experience and authors of the books about America's natural and cultural heritage. With us today is Marie Buck, president and CEO of WNPA. Marie, please accept this small memento to acknowledge Western National Park's outstanding service and dedication to the Tucson Festival of Books. We appreciate so much WNPA's role in enhancing, and enha enhancing the festival in our community. Thank you. All right. A big round of applause for Western National Parks Association. Thank you. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Pat Paris. Pat anchors the 5, 6, and 10 o'clock news at for K-Gun 9 TV. Pat is no stranger to Tucson and K-Gun 9. He's a graduate of the local Sabino High School. While in high school and college, he worked part-time in the K-Gun newsroom where he was an all-American college track star and graduated with a degree in broadcast news. 
He has 30 years of broadcasting experience, has won four regional Emmys for broadcasting excellence, and he's married, has two grown children. Please welcome Pat Paris. On air, online, on your side, you're watching K-Gun 9. We are on your side. All right. As you can see, I always wear red ties, apparently, with that picture in this one. Thank you so much for including me in the Tucson Festival Books. Again, this is my second year in a row of being able to help the Tucson Festival of Books celebrate literacy and literature. Festival, of course, one of my favorite events, one of Tucson's favorite events each year. And every year, thousands of Tucsonans and visitors anxiously await the authors and festivities of this marquee event. Now, we're especially grateful to have 400-plus authors participating at the festival. That's right, 400-plus. And we're really lucky to have 90 of them there with us tonight. They're all out there, and they're all sitting at your tables. Thank you to all 90 of them for coming tonight. You know, as William Faulkner said, read, read, read. Read everything, trash, classics, good and bad, and see how they do it. Just like a carpenter who works as an apprentice and studies the master, read, you'll absorb it. Then write. If it's good, you'll find out. If it's not, throw it out the window. Well, these 90-plus authors here tonight are really glad that they didn't have to throw that book out the window, and in fact, they're here for the weekend, and they'll see the live audiences with the smiling faces. Some of them will have some interesting questions, I'm sure. Plus, they're anxious to have you sign their books, and you'll be able to sell your new books as well. There is a whole new generation of book lovers out there, a young generation of book lovers out there, and they're experiencing different forms of literature. Take a look at this cartoon as it comes up. It says, but if you don't learn to read and write, how are you ever going to text? <laughs> There's a lot of truth to that, isn't there? Well, whatever works to get them to read, that's okay. Studies indicate that when children learn to read at a young age, they have greater general knowledge, expand their vocabulary, and attain higher levels of education. They also tend to have uh, improved curiosity, and better co co concentration, and the, the, that's exactly what we want to do here at the Tucson Festival of Books. It's all about reading, literacy, education, and paying tribute to the writers. Well, now it's my pleasure to introduce one of the multi-talented authors that we have this weekend. Sarah Ann Cooper is an American author and comedian. Sarah worked in design for Yahoo and in user experience for Google while also performing stand-up comedy. She has been guests on Jimmy Fallon, Jimmy Kimmel, Ellen DeGeneres, and more. Her books include 100 Tricks to Appear Smarter in Meetings. <laughs> How about this one? How to be successful without hurting men's feelings. And her new memoir, Foolish, Tales of Assimilation, Determination, and Humiliation. Please welcome Sarah Cooper. Hi, how are you? I am so excited to be here to accept the award for best author named Sarah Cooper, who is speaking right now. Um, thank you. I just want to give a round of applause to the volunteers, the wait staff, the organizers, the fans, the readers, everyone. I, um, I just have, I have two goals um, before I leave here. I want to have a normal conversation with an author, just one. Why are authors so weird? I don't know. Um, they're so weird. And I want to spell Tucson right the first time. If I could do that, if I could do those two things, I'd be happy. Um, I'm not sure what I'm doing here. Um, I wrote a book. No one bought it. No one read it. My mom hasn't even read my book. Um, 
she keeps saying, Sierra, I'm going to read your book, you know, I'm going to read it one day. And I'm like, Mom, you're 73. When are you going to read my book? Um, but my mom is such a beautiful person. She really helped me. Um, in 2021, I went through a divorce, and um, I went down to Florida to spend time with her, and I was just crying on the couch because I found out that I wasn't going to get child support. We don't have kids, but I wanted child support. <laughs> I wanted inner child support. Um, and my mom said, Sierra, don't sweat the small stuff. And guess what? It's all small stuff. And I said, Mom, that's the sign above the couch. Did you just read that to me? That's when I realized my mom has just been reading home goods decor to me around the house to give me advice. I called her this morning. I said, Mom, I don't know if I'm ever going to get married again. And she said, Sierra, you need to dance like no one is watching. <laughs> and I said, Mom, are you in the guest bathroom right now? And she said, yes. And then I heard a flush. And, um, that's my relationship with my mom. Um, some of you know me uh, for the lip syncing videos that I did of Donald Trump. Yeah, thank you. Really thought I got rid of that guy. Um, really thought it was over. Uh, have a few folks coming up to me saying I, I need to get back on that. I'm not gonna be doing that anymore, but I do have an announcement that is going to be exclusive to this moment right here. I have reached out to Donald Trump. I have asked if I could be his running mate. <laughs> because while he's giving his speeches, I can be standing next to him, lip syncing, and people can look at him and be like, wow, we're screwed, but then they can look at me and be like, this is hysterical, right? <laughs> Because that's one thing I've noticed about Americans is that, you know, as much as we want to survive, we also really want to have a good time, you know? So if we are elected, we will not survive, but we'll have fun. We'll have fun doing it. Um, thank you. Thank you. If Donald Trump, if you're here, you're not here. You're not here. I don't consider myself a, a controversial person, but I am going to say something that's pretty controversial. Um, I don't read books. <laughs> That's one thing I have in common with Trump, actually, is um, I, don't, I don't read. I, I don't read books. I feel so bad saying that. I feel like that's blasphemy. Um, that's one thing I wish I'd done before writing my book was read a book. That's one thing. <laughs> then maybe my book would be legible. Like, that would be, that would be great. But um, please don't be mad at me. I, I don't read, but I love buying them. I love buying them. I love buying books. I love opening up to the middle, reading one sentence and being like, that's a good sentence, and then closing them, putting them back on my shelf, and I don't know, it feels really good, but please don't be mad at the Viners, don't be mad at anybody for having me up. They didn't know, they didn't know. I'm a comedian. Um, I wrote stand-up bits for a long time, and um, I have been journaling, though. I've been journaling since I was 11. Are there any young people, young, young people here in the audience? Yeah, yeah. Start, start journaling, start writing. Um, I actually kept a journal in Google Docs all throughout my marriage, and it was on a fateful night where I decided to read those journals, and I realized that I had been writing the same thing about my marriage over and over again for eight years. And that's in a chapter in my book called Google Docs, knew I was getting a divorce before I did. Because um, that's when I realized, OK, I'm going in circles. I need to get a divorce. Um, and that, I think, is the really the cool thing about writing. It, it helps us see ourselves. We can evolve. We can see patterns. We can change those patterns if we want to. Um, I feel like writers are the most powerful people in the world. Um, doctors can suck it. Um, <laughs> unless I get sick during dinner. Um, but yeah, 
I believe that writers are extremely powerful. Writers cast spells, that's why it's called spelling, you know? That's, that's why write and R-I-G-H-T are both, they both sound the same, because when you write, it's right, right? Okay, I'm just workshopping these things, so I don't know. But I have started reading a book, I've joined a book club, things are looking up for me. Um, but I want to thank you. I want to thank the authors uh, for writing things that make me think, but also just make me feel. Make me feel jealous that you can write so well. Make me feel pain, sadness, joy, all of the things that only I can feel because I'm reading alone because I'm single. Did I mention I'm single? Okay. Um, <laughs> So hats off to you, congratulations to everyone here. I hope you have an amazing weekend and I hope to meet some of you uh, very soon. Thank you so much. Well, once again, Sarah, thank you, very funny. She will, by the way, be appearing twice this weekend. So another round of applause for Sarah Cooper. Very nice, very funny. Last year, this is amazing to me, 120,000 Southern Arizonans and visitors attended the Tucson Festival of Books weekend. And a larger crowd is expected this weekend. The weather will improve tomorrow, and it'll be terrific both tomorrow and on Sunday. But it's not just about the attendance or the weather we have in Tucson. It's also about the details, the authors, the volunteers, the hospitality, the venue, the diversity. And what an amazing job creating a fabulous event that all of Arizona and the authors can be proud of. Now I want to have you look at the video screen because we've got a short video here and it's remembering the first 14 years of the Tucson Festival of Books. I have often said to many of you in this room that the stars were aligned in this project. By partnering with the University of Arizona, the U of A bookstores, the Arizona Daily Star, we were on our way and we never looked back. I'm so proud of Tucson because for once, you all look like one gigantic New Yorker cartoon. When do we eat? <laughs> He's not funny, when will he shut up? I'm here just to hear Jance. In 1964, they wouldn't allow me in the creative writing program because I was a girl. <laughs> and so it was really wonderful in 2000 when they gave me an honorary doctorate of humane letters. One picture is worth a thousand words. You give me a thousand words and I can give you the Lord's Prayer, the 23rd Psalm, the Hippocratic Oath, a sonnet by Shakespeare, the preamble to the Constitution, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, the last graphs of Martin Luther King's speech to the March on Washington, and the final entry of Anne Frank's diary. You give me a thousand words, I wouldn't trade you for any picture on earth. Sports writer is the only occupation in journalism that I know of which is one word. It is as if the subject can't be separated from the journalist. Sports writer, one word. Everything else is two words. And it's often, or most often, it, it's not the stars who, who are the best people to write about uh, at all. The stars are young, nothing much has ever happened to them. What I think this place is really about is right here tonight with us. TFOB is what it's about. All of us together celebrating art, celebrating words, looking out for each other, and remembering we're a family. This is before 24-hour news networks, okay? I would go upstairs, watch the 11 o'clock news, and if something struck me at funny, it, it would be on Weekend Update a half hour later. Right as I didn't realize it at the time because I thought the whole world worked like that. And it was actually two times when I was with that show. While they were on the air doing Weekend Update, I was underneath the desk writing jokes and handing it up to them. I came here because I was an inveterate bookworm. I'm an English major. 
I'm a book addict. I can't go into a bookstore without buying three. Um, I read all the time. It's the only thing I really want to do. In fact, I would rather be home reading tonight than to be here <laughs> having to talk to you. Books live and change as we grow. And what we get out of them continues to change as well. Freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of thought, they're all inextricably linked and essential to our way of life. And books are the affirmation of that idea. And this book festival is an affirmation of that idea. I want to say to the writers, first and foremost, thank you for telling your stories, for giving us a way to walk through the world, for giving us a way out of no way. This is one of the books that's coming out from Versify. This is for the unforgettable, the swift and sweet ones who hurdled history and opened a world of possible. The Muhammad Ali's, the Althea Gibson's, the Jesse Owens, the Jordans and the LeBron's, the Serena's and the Cheryl's, the Nana Kwame's, the Waiyetu Moors, the Reese Whitley's and the undiscovered. This is for the unbelievable, the we real cool ones. This is for the unbending, the black as the night is beautiful ones. This is for the underdogs and the uncertain, the unspoken but no longer untitled. This is for the undefeated. This is for you and you and you and you and you. This is for us. It is an honor to be here before you assembled readers, writers, booksellers, and most of all, lovers of books. I am going to talk about young people today because I am very, very proud to be an author for young adults. What do we owe the next generation? We fight for our young people. We fight for them to have the truth because when we suppress that truth, whether it is because we are afraid to be vulnerable in our writing, or because we can't access books in, their, in high school libraries, we are leaving things hidden and unseen. We are allowing whole universes to lie silent because we lack courage, and our young people deserve better. Fourteen years going strong, year 15 this year. Now tonight we have some people that we want to recognize and thank them for being here. First uh, and foremost, uh, Tucson Mayor's Regina Romero. She is a big supporter and she's right over there. Give us a wave, Regina, thank you. Mayor of Tucson, Regina Romero. She's a big supporter of literacy and education and we thank her for her continued support of the Tucson Festival of Books. We are also excited to have actor Ed Begley Jr. and sportscaster Dan Patrick with us tonight, both over on this side of the room. Yeah, welcome to Ed and to Dan. By the way, Ed's going to be presenting here in the ballroom at 11:30 uh, and on Saturday tomorrow, and Dan has two sessions on Saturday as well. And we thank them for being here and uh, thank them for taking time to come to Tucson. Well, each year the National Book Foundation celebrates the best literature published in the United States and ensures that books continue to have a prominent place in our culture. We are honored to have six of the 2023 National Book Award honorees with us this year. You see their books, and as you look at their books, I'm gonna say their names, and let's, let's give a round for each one of these people. Alia Bilal, John, John Ike, and John Ike is actually at my table right here, table three. Way to go, table three. Brandon Som, John Valiant, Hannah Pilvinen, and last but not least, Vashti Harrison, you saw her briefly with her book, Big. Vashti has a special honor as well. She is the first black woman to win the coveted Caldecott Medal for her book, Big. Congratulations, Vashti. We 
We've also got to say hi to six of our past Founder Award recipients, and we're going to uh, say their names and have them stand as well to be recognized as they uh, just did, uh, deservedly so. R.L. Stein. We've got one of our favorites as well, who's been to every single Tucson Festival of Books, J.A. Jantz. T.C. Boyle. Another big favorite, Luis Alberto Urea. Lisa C. And also Thomas Perry. Now the Founders Award winners are extremely talented and successful authors and have been incredible supporters and advocates of this Tucson Festival of Books. Thanks to all of them. Thanks for all that you do to help support the Tucson Festival of Books. It's now my pleasure to welcome the Festival Steering Committee co-chairs. It's Kim Rosborough and Teresa Shore. They are both uh, coming up now, and they are the co-chairs for the Steering Committee. J.D. Salinger wrote, what really knocks me out is a book that when you're all done reading it, you wish the author that wrote it was a terrific friend of yours, and you could call him or her up on the phone whenever you felt like it. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen very often. The Authors' Table Dinner gives you the unique opportunity to meet and talk to your favorite authors and is the start to a special literary weekend. Shauna Henderson and Mindy Griffith, along with their committee members, made sure the Authors' Dinner Table continues to be a Tucson favorite. Great work. <laughs> this literary celebration would not happen without the dedication of all the steering committee members, literary consultant Lynn Weezy Sneed, marketing director Megan Reinold, office coordinator Carla Chavez, and 2,000 volunteers. Hello. If you have not been to the festival, it's hard to imagine. 400 authors, 295 presentations, 33 venues, 225 exhibitors, a literary circus, Western National Parks exhibit, a children's area, Science City, the Philandro Planetarium, C-SPAN, food vendors, entertainment stages, and much more. So here's a quick look at the festival.
Our festival sponsors are dedicated to improving our community. The University of Arizona is the ultimate partner and the perfect environment for the festival. Thanks to Dr. Robbins, Chris Kopak, UA College of Ed, College of Science, UA Bookstore staff, and many others for their continued involvement and support. The Arizona Daily Star is an exceptional media partner, and their talented team has spent countless hours producing a fabulous database, website, apps. I'd highly recommend if you come to the festival, download the app, plan your route, instituting the ticketing process, publishing the festival guide, and hosting a venue on the U of A Mall, thanks to David McCumber and his entire team. We are very proud to have Tucson Medical Center as our presenting sponsor. They are not only committed to the festival, but to numerous community projects and causes. Make sure and see their venue as you stroll the mall. Thank you, Judy Rich, Mimi Comer, and the entire staff of TMC Healthcare. We would also like to acknowledge Tucson Electric Power, the Stocker Foundation, UA Bookstores, UA Facilities Management, the Marshall Foundation, Western National Parks, the William and Mary Ross Foundation, Pima County Library, Arizona Appliance in Home, as well as the other names you have seen scrolling on the video in your program. Last but certainly not least, in addition to putting on a remarkable festival, we are equally proud that during the last 14 years, the festival has provided $2.2 million to various community-based organizations to enrich literacy in Southern Arizona. Quite an accomplishment. Chris and Kim, thank you so much. $2.2 million, how about that? Yeah, worth another round of applause. All right, one lucky person at each table, if you look at your program, has a sticker on that program, and that person is the one that gets to keep the book in the center of the table. So we ask the authors, authors, be sure to sign the book and autograph it for that lucky winner. That got people pretty excited. All right, I know we have some memoir writers in the house, like Allison Camarota, Julia Keller, and Sophia Sinclair, memoir writers. Writing a memoir not only takes a lot of thought, but can be stressful. It can be stressful in some regards, especially for the parents of those memoir writers. Look at this cartoon. Look, we're sorry, if we'd known you were going to be a writer, we'd have been better parents. <laughs> I'm about to introduce one of the uh, co-founders of the Tucson Festival of Books, and I just want to take this moment to thank Brenda Viner, who I'm about to bring up, and also Bill Viner. 15 years of the Tucson Festival of Books. Thank you so much, and thank you for having me as the MC. It is my pleasure to introduce Brenda Viner, co-founder of the Tucson Festival of Books, for the pre presentation of the 2024 Founders Award. Brenda. are the quietest and most constant of friends. They are the most accessible and wisest of counselors and the most patient of teachers. Joyce Carol Oates put it precisely when she said, they are the most. Reading is the sole means by which we slip involuntarily, often helplessly, into another's skin, another's voice, another's soul. 
Tonight, we honor and acknowledge the writers participating in the Tucson Festival of Books. They are the ones who bring words and imagination to life. From William Kent Kruger, to Jean Kwok, to Craig Johnson, we are awed by the author's passion, talent, and achievements. Their wit, thought, and ideas are a wonderful gift to all of us. For those favorites, C.J. Box, Beverly Jenkins, Lou Burney, and Tim Egan, who are returning to the festival, we sincerely appreciate your support. And the newcomers, like Yang Sing Chu, Joe Ide, and Angie Kim, we hope this is the first of many visits to Tucson and the festival. In 2011, the Tucson Festival of Books established the Founders Award. The award honors literary achievement that has captivated our imagination and whose body of work will be an inspiration to readers, writers, and book lovers. We continue to be inspired by the past honorees. I think the more you write, the harder it gets, because you don't want to write the same scenes over and over. You want to keep it fresh. I'm in my 80s, and I still love to write. It's one of the pleasures of being a novelist is the capacity to go backward and forward in time and see your characters and visit them at different times of their lives. Last time I spoke at the University of Arizona was 35 years ago, and I spoke to 22 people. <laughs> I think the whole point of my career has been about getting kids to read, and that's what I'm most proud of. All I want kids to take away from these books is the fact that you can turn to reading and just be entertained. Maybe you've heard me tell my all-time favorite letter. This was from a boy. Dear R.L. Stein, I've read 40 of your books, and I think they're really boring. <laughs> In some way, a good book is as exciting and rewarding as anything In you're life. ever going to do in your life. The previous winners of the Founders Award are all iconic authors. And two of them, Elmore Leonard and Larry McBurtry, are personal heroes of mine. People who are really writers write when their lives are imperfect. Because if you're waiting for perfection, you're never going to get around to writing at all. It's a mad world we live in, in a world that is mysterious, undefined, without purpose and I try to make purpose by making art. I don't want to know the ending. I want to find out. I mean, this is why it's so exciting to me and why I only write fiction. Poetry has become, it's probably the most egotistical of the arts because the, the self is foregrounded and the self is the subject, the I. When I was a uh, United States Poet Laureate, and I love saying that, um, <laughs> it's a great way to start sentences. First Latino to get the award. You know, I've watched this festival go through so many challenges. Political upheaval, ethnic problems, uh, literacy upheavals, Jim Harrison. <laughs> Jim was spectacular. Um, so many things have happened. Weather, and here we are now. Books and stories are a way for us to reach out into the world to reflect, to escape, and again, I just want to say how grateful I am to receive the Founders Award, and I hope all of you stay safe and well, and that next year we can all be together again. I always thought of myself as a writer when I was growing up. Didn't think it was so practical, that's why I ended up going to law school, but I couldn't stay being a lawyer when there were things that I wanted to do and stories that I wanted to tell. Earning a living as a writer, you know, that's like earning a living going to parties or something, you know. 
I try to write a story that a, a reader has never read before. And to the extent that anybody is ever going to remember anything that anyone does in this field, it'll be for things that we write that never would have existed if we didn't write them. I have the honor tonight to introduce our the 2024 Founders Award to Chief Jefferson Parker. <laughs> the T in Jeff's name doesn't stand for anything. His mother said she thought it would look good on the presidential letterhead. You can still jump in the race. Parker has lived his entire life in Southern California. He was educated in public schools and received his bachelor's degree from the University of California, Irvine in English. He began his writing career as a journalist for the Newport Ensign. Parker later switched jobs to the Daily Pilot winning three Orange County Press Club Awards. It was at this time that he began writing his first novel, Laguna Heat. He received the Edgar Award for Best Novel in 2002 for Silent Joe, and again in 2005 for California Girl. And then he went on in 2008, his short story, Skinhead Central, won Parker another Edgar Award making him one of the elite writers to have won the Edgar three times. Parker has written 28 novels, including his latest work, The Rescue. Parker is renowned for using California settings in depicting the effects of crime on a community. When Parker is not writing, he spends time with his family and enjoys hiking, hunting, fishing, and playing tennis. Jeff is a very talented writer and has been a tremendous supporter of the book festival. As fellow writer Greg Hurwitz said, T. Jefferson Parker is a marvel. I've been reading him with delight and admiration for years. He hits the high water mark for crime fiction every time out. Here is a tribute to our 2024 Founders Ward recipient. You know, a lot of writing is, it, it, it's not just how well you write. It's the story that you choose to tell. You can spend a lot of beautiful words. You want to pick that story that you deserve or deserves you or something like that. I was born in Los Angeles, California in 1953, and I'm the author of mystery thriller novels. The first one was published in 1985. I came to stories real early when I was young, too young to really even understand the English language. My mother read to me while I was in the crib, and I uh, responded to those words and those stories somehow. They, they hypnotized me, and later when I uh, was a little older and could understand, mom and dad would read me books and many, many, many stories, nature stories typically, illustrated books. I always loved them, and I, I carried a love of story and, and books into into school and into high school and into college where I studied English. I got a job on a weekly newspaper, pretty much right out of college, a paper called the Newport Ensign. And that's where I learned the basics of writing journalism, you know, the who, what, where, when, and why. From a purely practical point, it was great because at five o'clock every day, I would unplug, this is how old I am, I would unplug my IBM Selectric <laughs> typewriter. I would unplug it, reach down, unplug it from the wall, and then I would take a stack of maybe 20 sheets of brand new clean typing paper and I'd set it on the Selectric and I'd wrap the cord around it and I'd stand, I'd watch the second hand. Five o'clock I would stand up and I would run to my car and I would throw that in the trunk of my, pin, <laughs> the back of my Pinto station wagon and I would hightail it home to my little apartment and I would start writing on my book. So I know I not only got to ride along with the cops and get paid for it, I got to steal the paper and I got to use their typewriter. 
uh, I threw away 2,500 pages of Kuhn Laguna heat before I wrote draft number six, and I would banish from that draft any conscious efforts to duplicate or echo my literary heroes. My voice came out in that and when I was able to, to, to turn down the volume on all my heroes, you know? Based on the national bestseller, Laguna Heat tells the story of Tom Shepard's return to Laguna Beach, where he becomes obsessed with the investigation like the past. Thank your big city smarts can cut this one, Shepard. If you can handle that, I'd like your company to meet. Laguna Heat, somewhere between passion and danger. The reason that I do this is because I really do kind of like to write. I like it, you know? The rewards are a good sentence or a good paragraph or a good line of dialogue, a good twist or turn of story that, that people aren't, aren't seeing necessarily. In the writing of the first draft, without any notes and no input, that clean first draft where you've got a ream of 500 blank sheets of paper and it's your job to fill them up, I love that part. I think that's great. Welcome T. Jefferson Parker. <laughs> Jeff, on behalf of the Book Festival, we are honored to present you with this Native American Storyteller Founders Award. Congratulations. Wow. <laughs> I'm having a really great night, I gotta tell you. Um, terrific people, terrific, the best, I'm at the best book festival in the United States. I had, I had a great dinner. I'm, I'm, I'm here to accept a wonderful, meaningful award, and I won a copy of my own book at the dinner table. <laughs> I mean, when you're hot, you're hot. Uh, I'll, uh, you know, it, it's, it's stories, 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 and stories. So I'll tell you a story. This one's true. I alluded to it in the clip, but I'll, I'll tell you a little more. Um, when I was very small in the crib, newborn basically, um, I was extremely unhappy all the time. Uh, colicky and fussy and unhappy and ugh. And mom couldn't figure out what to do with me. And, and, and she would hug me and rock me and, and talk to me and everything. And nothing would really do any good. And uh, one day she decided that all she could really do was sit beside me in the crib while I threw myself around. And she would try to read because she was a great reader. And so she tried reading to herself. And she couldn't concentrate because of me. And so she thought, you know, I'm going to read over this kid. And so she went vocal. She went, she went oral on it. And she turned up the volume and she read to me. And no, no sooner had she begun when I stopped my caterwauling and focused my little beady eyes and listened to her. And I was quiet. And it worked almost all the time. Flash forward just a few years, um, mom again, in our little suburban home in Tustin, California, in the living room which was uh, um, orange carpet and aqua walls and white Naga Hyde furniture. Me and mom on the white Naga Hyde couch. Mom reading animal and nature stories to me. And by then, of course, I could, I could understand the words and I could understand the stories. I wasn't in the crib not understanding one thing. I was listening to stories. And I made her read them all to me all, over and over again. Perry the Squirrel, Bambi. Vulcan the Condor, my favorite that I still have at home, Shag, Last of the Plains of Buffalo. And I loved those stories so much, so much. Uh, some of my great memories were of those, those stories and their stories. A few years later, sophomore in high school, Miss Page's mythology and folklore class, which I took because I thought it would be an easy A. I didn't care about mythology or folklore. I just wanted an easy class. And Miss Page was a, a, a lovely, educated, passionate woman. She loved mythology and folklore, and our class was stubborn. This was not, this, I didn't make enriched English. This was basic bonehead English in a public school. And I was one of them, and she became so disgusted at our class that 
that she brought in one day. She, she announced that she was not going to be able to teach us anything today and that a lot of us were, in fact, incapable of learning. <laughs> and she had brought in a, a, a box of pasteboard paperbacks that she'd read and treasured throughout her life, and she ordered us to form a single file line and come up to the box on her desk and close your eyes and pick out a book and take it back to your desk and read it uh, in silence. And so when it was my turn, I stepped up and I closed my eyes and I reached into the box and I pulled out a thick, well-used copy of a book called Catch-22 by Joseph Heller. And I took it back to my, to my desk and I started reading it because that was the orders from Miss Page. And I started kind of smiling to myself because it was so interesting and it was so different. It was so weird. And I read it for those 45 minutes and then I took it home for the next couple weeks and read it. I'm a slow reader, so it took me a while. But I read that book and at the end of the, the, the time that I'd read that book, I thought it was just the most fantastic book I'd ever read. It was better than La Shag, Last of the Plains Buffalo, for sure. It was, it was funny and it was subversive and it was nothing like my school teachers or my parents or Tustin Redhill Lutheran Church was trying to teach me. He was on a different level. And that made me think, you know, if you could be a writer someday and write something that would entertain people uh, one one thousandth of the, t of the amount of entertainment that you got out of that book, you would have to count yourself a, a, a lucky man. And at that moment, I think, as a sophomore in high school, it made me want to be a writer, even though I had no idea what that meant and I had no stories to tell and I had no notion of how to even go about it, and I didn't get around to it uh, for many years after that. So flash forward again, a few years out of college, I sat down and I wrote a novel. And it took me a year, and it wasn't any good, and I knew it. And uh, I sent it to a, to a publisher anyway, because I knew him from a, meeting him at a party, and he wrote back and he said, Parker, I can't publish this, nobody will. Nobody, nobody cares about a young surfer growing up in Newport Beach. But, you have a little bit of talent, and you have stick to because you finish that book, and most people don't finish their books. So try again, write something more commercial, read the New York Times bestseller list, uh, you know, uh, little synopses, and write something better. And I said, okay. So I took a year and I wrote another book, and I was proud of the book until I realized that I had 500 pages of bad Hemingway. So I threw it away and I rewrote it, it took another year, and at the end of that year, I realized, same book, but I had 500 pages of bad Raymond Chandler. And then after year three, it was bad Jim Harrison, and after year four, it was bad Gabriel Garcia Marcus, and af after <laughs> year five, it was bad Tom McGuane. So if, at the end of that, I said, okay, I've had enough, I'm only going to write it one more time. And I'm going to banish all my heroes, and I'm going to try to sound like me. And I don't know if it'll be a good book or not, but it's going to be my book. So I, I, I spent another year and I wrote it, and I realized at the end of that book, it, 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 I didn't know if it was good or not, or if it was worth writing, or if it was worth reading, but it was as good as I could do. So I sent it off, and I got lucky, and a year and a half later, it was published. And that was my first book, Laguna Heat, which I talked about on the, on the thing a lot. So I'll be brief here. Let me tell you what it's like to begin a novel, to get ready to write the first sentence of a novel when you're convinced that you're ready to write it. This is what it feels like. It feels like standing on a, a diving board in the dark at night when you can't see anything. All you have on is your trunks. It's cold. And you know you have to make this dive. You have to make this dive in order to begin the first sentence of this book. And you don't know, because it's blackout, if, it's, if that water is, is five feet down or 10 feet down or maybe 20 feet down, but you know that you have to make the dive, not a jump, a dive, in order to begin writing the book. And that's what you do. And you take the dive. And I've done that, I've made that dive 30 times in 44 years, which is as long as I've been writing. And uh, I took one just recently, just a couple of months ago. Thank you, thank you. And uh, uh, so, so the things that you always think about before the dive and after you've made the dive are is this book worth writing? Is this book worth reading? Is this book good? And I ask myself that after every book and after every dive. And I can say that um, tonight, I think I believe, uh, I believe clearly and fully for the first time that, that those books were worth writing and worth reading and are good. 
thanks to you. Thank you. Congratulations again to T. Jefferson Parker, our 2024 Founders Award recipient. The festival is very proud to have TMC Health as its presenting sponsor. They are a terrific asset to our community. Here tonight is Mimi Kumler, Chief Executive Officer for Tucson Medical Center. Mimi ensures the day-to-day -day operational excellence of Tucson's largest hospital and TMC Health's flagship facility with 568 acute care beds and more than 4,000 employees. Celebrating its 80th birthday in 2024, Tucson Medical Center proudly welcomes TMC Rincon to the TMC family. TMC Rincon is the region's newest hospital serving Southeast Tucson at Houghton and Drexel. Please welcome Mimi Kumler. TMC Health is a trusted system of care for all your health care needs. It's Tucson Medical Center, combined with primary and specialty care at TMC One offices, convenient urgent care centers, and introducing TMC Rincon at Houghton and Drexel. TMC Health is a seamless healthcare experience that offers better care, not for profit, for you. 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 Me? Yes, you. TMC Health, you first. Wow, good evening, and thank you for that very kind and lovely introduction. It is absolutely my pleasure to introduce tonight's keynote speaker, Abraham Verghese. Abraham Verghese is a best-selling author and a physician. He received the Heinz Award in 2014 and was awarded the National Humanities Medal presented by President Barack Obama in 2015. Born in Addis Ababa in 1955, the second of three sons of Indian parents, he began his medical training in Ethiopia. It was interrupted by civil war, and um, he then resumed his medical training and completed it in India. After graduation, he left India for a medical residency in the United States. Abraham Verghese's early years as an orderly his care of terminal AIDS patients, and the insights he gained from the deep relationships he formed and the suffering he witnessed were transformative. These were the cumulative experiences around which his first book, My Own Country, A Doctor's Story, is centered. The book was chosen as one of the best books of the year by time and later filmed by Showtime as My Own Country. Cutting for Stone, my favorite, became a literary phenomenon, selling over 1.5 million copies in the United States alone and remaining on the New York Times bestseller list for over two years. His new release, The Covenant of, of Water, which I did not win at our table, uh, but I have my own copy, is a hymn to the progress in medicine and to human understanding and a humbling testament to hardships undergone by past generations for the sake of those alive today. Please join me in a warm Tucson welcome for Abraham Fergie. Thank you so much, Mimi, for that generous introduction and uh, for all the wonderful work that TMC and you do for the community and your support of this festival. I must say, I'm in awe of the fact that 
you managed to bring in 300 plus authors, have 300 presentations, and over 100,000 people get to attend this festival free. That is amazing. The only thing I don't quite understand is you have all these distinguished authors here, people I admire, that I read. Uh, why you pick me to do the keynote, I'm not quite sure, but I, I will happily give it a try. Your festival is all about, as I understand it, education, literacy, books, reading, writing. And I thought I would share with you a little bit about how books, a book brought me to medicine and how later medicine would bring me to write a book and then another. As you heard, I was, I was born in Ethiopia, but of Indian parents. My parents were school teachers there and my brother and I were born there. And Indian parents, I always think, are very similar to, to other Asian pa parents and also to Jewish parents in that as a child you grow up thinking that your choices in life are you can either be a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer, or a failure. <laughs> These are your options. And uh, my, my older brother, by the age of seven, it was very clear that he was a mathematical genius. Uh, in fact, he's a professor at MIT right now. He's, he's about to retire after many years. But my brother's genius was so evident at the age of seven, whereas I had a very undistinguished school career. I was, um, you know, just not very good or not willing to work very hard. But I remember distinctly the moment that my brother announced to my parents that he was going to be an engineer. Their joy was something to behold. And I, I was, you know, I was taken aback. I was envious. And so I promptly announced that I was going to be a physician. <laughs> they were kind of silent. I mean, they, they didn't laugh outright at me, but uh, they didn't say anything either. I suppose at one level it was plausible because I had an unwholesome interest in blood, mostly my own. <laughs> getting into scrapes a lot. And I had a morbid fascination with the animals being slaughtered for the houses next door, the restaurant next door. So they didn't shoot it down entirely. Despite being a mediocre student, the one thing I had going for me was that I was a, a avid reader, a precocious reader. I uh, started with the Hardy Boys and Enid Blyton and quickly found uh, C.S. Forster and, and the Hornblower series of novels that took me sailing in the Napoleonic era all across the universe, across the world. And I think I was nine or 10 when I stumbled onto Lady Chatterley's Lover. <laughs> and that suddenly changed the trajectory of my reading. And it is the reason that I picked up the book that ultimately was to change my life, that was to bring me to medicine. Uh, I picked up Of Human Bondage by Somerset Maugham because the title held great promise. <laughs> but to my, to my surprise and my, my joy, uh, the book turned out to be far better than anything my prurient imagination had conjured up. Uh, for those of you who don't know the book, it is it's sort of a dated book, uh, but I've had the great pleasure of writing a new foreword for a, for a Penguin edition. For those of you who don't know the book, it begins on page one with this little boy, Philip, the main character of the book, being brought to his mother's deathbed. And on page one, you also discover that he has a club foot. He has a deformity of his, of his lower extremity. And by page two, she has had enough time to say goodbye to him, and she's dead. The father is not in the picture. He's previously died. So it's the most morbid start to a novel that you can ever imagine. Really sad. And so Philip is brought up by his 
uh, distant relatives, a pastor and his wife, and it's a fairly strict and harsh childhood. He's bullied because of his club foot, and um, the household is very strict. His only escape is that he loves to sketch, he loves to paint. And so as soon as he comes of age, he takes off against his foster parents' uh, uh, wishes, takes off to Germany and then eventually to Paris where he becomes an artist, living the life he dreamed about. He stays in the left bank in a little garret and he takes lessons at the salon with Monsieur Boinet. This is his dream. But a couple of months into it, he begins to have doubts. Uh, one day he's standing outside his apartment. He's shivering and uh, he's standing outside the apartment to avoid his landlady and he's shivering because he sold his coat for money. He's desperate. And he's beginning to doubt if he has the talent to do this. And so he goes, he sees his, his, his professor, Monsieur Fournay, sitting at a restaurant where he usually eats and he goes and asks him, would you come up and look at my paintings and tell me if you think I have the talent to go on. And Monsieur Fournay takes this seriously and you sense that he's not the kind of man who usually does this. And he comes up, looks at all his paintings and after a while he says, and, and do you have, do you have, you know, wh what are your resources like? How is your money? And Philip very apologetically says that he doesn't have very much money. And Monsieur Fournay says an interesting thing. He says, don't be apologetic about not having money. For an artist, money is like a sixth sense. And without it, the other five don't work very well. So whenever I'm actually asked to give writing advice, which is very rare, um, I will often say it. I'm not being facetious. I will say, get a day job, something you really love. Because I think it's really hard, and my admiration to all the writers here who managed to make a living, pay the college tuition for their kids on the writing. I've been blessed to have another profession that I didn't, I didn't have to do that. But back to Monsieur Fournay. He finally, after looking at the painting, essentially says to Philip, is there something else you could be doing? And this is obviously crushing for Philip, but that's what he wanted. He wanted the honest, honest, uh, assessment of if he has the talent. And Monsieur Fournay says one more interesting thing. He says, don't take this badly. I wish someone had told me what I'm telling you because there's nothing worse for the temper than discovering one's own mediocrity at an advanced age. <laughs> and so Philip with his tail between his legs goes back to London, but he's satisfied. This, this art thing is out of the way. There's a little annuity left for him to go to medical school uh, or any school. And so he goes to medical school. The first two years are drudgery. But in his third year, he finally arrives on the wards. And he's just intrigued by seeing all kinds of different patients from different backgrounds, unique personalities struggling with one illness or another. And the whole thing is just captivating to him. And, and he's, it, 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 for me, that, past, that, that part of the book, that page, echoes a very famous quote by William Osler, a very famous American physician who died in 1917. Uh, Osler said, it doesn't matter what disease this patient has, it matters what kind of patient has the disease. But you really have to get to know the people. And so Philip Somerset Maugham, on that page, says the following line, which brought me to my calling. Somerset Maugham writes, Philip thinks, Philip saw humanity there in the rough, the artist's canvas, and he said to himself, this is something I can do. This is something I can be good at. Ladies and gentlemen, th th those lines spoke to me. It was like, you know, I don't know, it was like St. Paul on the road to Damascus. I felt I felt my being shaken by this. And I had the recognition, perhaps a very personal one, 
that not anybody could be a great mathematician or a great artist or writer, but pretty much anyone with a willingness to work hard, with a empathy for their fellow human beings, a curiosity about their fellow human beings, could be a good doctor. And I saw medicine as a romantic and passionate pursuit, all because of that one line. And I really wanted to jump up and announce to my parents, I'm going to be a doctor. But, you know, I already had said that previously. <laughs> but moreover, this is what books do. This is the quiet epiphany that makes us read, to see the, the course of our life, the, the, the prow of your ship altered by words in a novel that speak to you in a very unique way. And to me, medicine was a wonderful pursuit. Uh, I never thought I'd ever be a writer. I had no ambition to be a writer until I, in the 80s, I, I trained in internal medicine and then I specialized in infectious diseases at a time when infectious disease, to me, was the one specialty that was all about cure. You know, the, the cardiologist butts around with their catheters and this and that. But in infectious disease, apologies to my cardiology friends here, <laughs> but in infectious disease, you could make an astute diagnosis and the patient would rise like Lazarus. Um, you know, that was the attraction. And it was so ironic that my specialty would wind up being the care of people with HIV, with a fatal illness. And when I got to my fellowship in Boston for the two years of training, we first started to see this trickle of primarily young men with bizarre infections and uh, you know, no known explanation. And for another year and a half, we worked with that cumbersome definition of AIDS because we didn't have a test, we didn't have a name for the condition. And I remember waking up one morning and picking up the Boston Globe to learn that this had been, the cause had been discovered by Gallo and Montagne, or Montagne and Gallo, whoever you believe. And within a week or two, we had an ELISA test to test people. And suddenly, we began to realize that for every one person in the hospital, there were perhaps 100 people out there carrying the virus without symptoms, but likely to have the same downhill progression. But I was leaving Boston. I was going to Johnson City, Tennessee, population 50,000, to a fairly new medical school. And everyone told me that I could expect to see no HIV in that little town, or maybe one patient every other year. Uh, but instead, when I got there, in what I thought was a pretty short time, two or three years, I had accumulated 100 people with HIV infection in this town of 50,000. A hundredfold more than the CDC or anyone predicted. And the explanation was not that the town was a hotbed of sexual intrigue and duplicity, which it was, by the way, but <laughs> that wasn't the explanation. Instead, it appeared that I had stumbled onto an American phenomenon of migration, which I was convinced was playing out in every small town in America. A paradigm, if you like. And the paradigm goes like this. A young man grows up in a small town and leaves for all the same reasons that you and I leave small towns. Jobs, education, opportunity. But in their case, they were leaving because they were gay and did not want to live that lifestyle under the close scrutiny of their friends and relatives. And they went to the big city, uh, spent decades there, found themselves, lived the life that they wanted. But tragically, at some point, the virus found them. And now they were coming back, typically because their partners who they had nursed had now died, and now they were ill, and they had no alternative but to come home. And there I was at the tail end of this, of this trail uh, and becoming their physician. Uh, it was a very powerful experience in my life. Uh, I always say I learned more about manhood from gay men than I did from heterosexual men in terms of their courage, their interest in everything, their love of travel, all the things that I think sometimes 
heterosexuals can confine themselves in roles of machismo, at least I did, until I met them and saw the scope of this. I wrote a scientific paper describing this phenomenon of migration because I was sure it was happening everywhere. And it's a very widely cited paper in the HIV literature. But even as I wrote it, I knew that the language of science didn't begin to capture the tragic nature of this voyage, didn't begin to capture the grief of the families, didn't begin to capture my own heartache at watching this happen again and again. And that was the moment that I became a writer. I want to wind down by, by telling you that um, I think writing is terribly important. I'm always, I'm sorry, I think reading is terribly important. I love to scare my medical students, or really scare anybody, by telling them that if they don't have the practice of taking the little things we call words on a page, the little digital signals that we call words on a page, if they don't have the practice of taking that into the cortex and making this mental movie, a part of the brain will atrophy. I don't think there's another device out there that can stop time the way that a good novel can. I love this feeling of picking up a book, uh, preferably a big one, and living through generations, wars, births, death, and you put it down and it's still Tuesday. <laughs> Nothing else can do that. In fact, I get very impatient with my, with my colleagues, especially medicine, who, who often say, well, I'm, I'm a serious kind of guy. I only read nonfiction. I said, really? You're a serious kind of guy? Have you heard of Uncle Tom's Cabin? Uncle Tom's Cabin probably ended slavery in this country because that novel and its popularity just made slavery no longer palatable. It wasn't a president. It wasn't a an army. Or take the book The Citadel by A.J. Cronin in the UK. That book depicting mining, medical and medical conditions in a mining town in Wales, that book caused such a public reaction that the National Health Service was born. Books matter. Fiction is the great lie that tells the truth about how the world lives. And we read books, we write books in order to digest and understand this wonderful, beautiful, complex, scary world we live in. Uh, I love what you're doing. I love that all of you support this wonderful festival. Uh, I can imagine kids who don't have a book in their house, but by Monday they will be carrying a book in their house. They will possess a book because of you. And perhaps one of them will one day become a writer. Perhaps one of them will be giving this speech here one day. So I thank you for your supporting of the festival. I thank my fellow writers, the wonderful volunteers, and especially all of you who support this magical festival. It's my first time, but I can tell you I've never quite seen anything of this magnitude, and thank you for having me here. Thank you, Abraham. Well done, very well done. All right, as you're getting ready to leave tonight, we want to invite you to uh, pick this up. It is the Arizona Daily Star program for the next two days. And you're gonna want this, and you're gonna wanna probably stay up a little bit tonight and kinda look at the calendar, mark your course of action for tomorrow and Sunday so you don't miss any of these wonderful authors. We thank you as you leave we invite you to enjoy this weekend. We know you'll have a grand time. Thank you to all the authors who attended tonight. Have a fun festival the next two nights, uh, two days, and have a good night. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>